This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and discord servers, on screen shout outs and early access to some videos. When you join now, help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. I've seen a lot of Browns, what the Browns can do to free up salary cap videos. And I don't think very many of them have been very helpful to the average fan trying to understand what the Browns cap situation is. So what I want to do is throw my hat into the ring and try to talk about the Browns salary cap situation and what the Browns can do with their salary cap situation to make it better in ways that are actually going to be helpful and are probable to being used. Um, since we're talking about the salary cap, I have to break out the glasses. I'm just kidding. I just have my glasses on because it's that time for me to have my glasses on. But let's talk about the salary cap. And before we really get into who or what the Browns are going to do, let's talk about how the salary cap works there are two things that most people fixate on when it comes to salary cap conversation guaranteed money left and cap hit the reason people fixate on those two numbers are because well the amount of guaranteed money a player has left determines how difficult it's going to be to get rid of that player and the cap hit that that player has determines whether that team wants to keep that player versus where their cap hit is. Now, it's important to note that just because a player has a super high cap hit, that doesn't mean that all of that money is hitting his bank account that year. What that means is that however the team structured the contract, that money is due to hit the salary cap that year. That money's probably in that player's pocket by the time um, the salary cap number hits. So those two things, guaranteed money, what that player's making that year, and the salary cap are all not the same thing. They are all independent. They all operate independently of each other and sometimes with each other, but they're all different. For example... Keenan Allen on the Los Angeles Chargers in 2024 is scheduled for a $34 million cap hit. Now, his base salary is actually $18 million. That's what he's likely to make. His guaranteed salary is $0, so he's not guaranteed to make anything. So, if the Chargers cut him, um, what, post June 1st, or even just if they cut him, period, right? Because they don't have much guaranteed money left on that contract, they can save some cap money, um, some cap space by getting rid of Keenan Allen. Right now it says that they would save about $23 million because I think he has a prorated bonus that he's due that's going to stop them from saving the whole $34 million. Another example on the same team is Mike Williams. His base salary, what he's likely to make throughout the year in his personal bank account, is $17 million. His cap number is $32 million. So they've pushed money back, they moved it around, and now $34 million set to hit the cap this year. But his guaranteed number is $0. So similar to Keenan Allen, they can cut him um, before June 1st. And they would save $20 million because he has a prorated bonus of $12 million that prevents them from saving the whole 32. So that's kind of the most simple way of how this works. But that's not always super useful, right? Just talking about it and guaranteed money and cap hits because cutting a player is not the only way that you can reduce a cap hit. You have a lot of other options, right? You could re-sign a player if you want to lower a cap hit. You can restructure a player if you want to lower a cap hit. Now, the reason re-signing 
a player could lower a cap hit is because you extend the number of years on the contract. If you extend the number of years on the contract, you have more years in which you could spread more money out throughout the length of that contract. And in the NFL, where the salary cap rises pretty consistently, right? The last number I saw was about 8% a year. It rises about that much. Since that is the case, it's better from a salary cap perspective to spread contracts out over long periods of time because if you spread out what is a twenty a two hundred million dollar contract over a lot of time, the percentage of cap that's going to be over that seven years is going to go down, 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 down the longer you have that money spread out. So it's a way to minimize how much your cap hit is. It's a very regular strategy that teams do. It's why when teams re-sign a player or extend a player, they have a couple of years of extreme flexibility in the salary cap because they have the most years to work with and spread money out down the line. So re-signing a player is a way that you can make things work out for the salary cap in the often misunderstood restructure. Now, the first thing that comes up with the restructure is people asking, well, will this player want to restructure their deal? Yeah, they probably will. Um, restructuring is a process where teens basically restructure how the money hits the salary cap. So Deshaun Watson's a great example of this, right? Deshaun Watson's probably going to be restructured from $62 million down to a cap hit of $33 million. Now, where did $30 million go that the Browns are going to free up for 2024? That didn't disappear, right? That's going to be spread out through the last years of that contract and whatever void years that Deshaun Watson has. Also, real quick, if you don't know what void years are, those are years added to the end of a contract that really only serve a purpose to spread money out. Again, it goes back to that principle. The salary cap continues to rise every year. And if the salary cap continues to rise, it's a safer bet and a better bet from a salary cap perspective to spread money out throughout the long term. And void years are a way of spreading money out throughout the long term without necessarily making a commitment to that player to keep them on the team and that player having to make a commitment to keep you on the team. Think about Pat Mahomes' 10-year contract, right? He has a 10-year contract a lot of players are on the books for a very long time Ben Roethlisberger recently just got off the books for the Pittsburgh Steelers despite being retired the last couple of years because of void years so that's kind of how all of that works now restructures are basically just moving money around in the current contract the reason why players like it is because it guarantees them money that might not have been guaranteed, right? It gives them roster bonuses and everything else in front. So it's like they're getting an advance on their money interest-free. They like it, right? Most players are fine with a restructure. Um, there are limited situations where a player might not want to restructure, but for the most part, a restructure is something that a player is okay with doing because it puts more money in their account at the cost of nothing, right? They're not losing money. They're not taking a pay cut. They're not not getting money. They're actually getting more money than they probably would have or that they possibly could have gotten if they would have like not hit a bonus or something up front. So the restructure is something that players are likely to want to do if it makes sense. The front office likes restructures for some players because it makes sense to do this, i.e. quarterbacks or franchise level players. You're usually the ones you want to do this. You don't want to get restructure crazy because with restructuring, you're eventually going to add dead money and you don't want a year of dead money to be super high and dead money. If I didn't explain this already, dead money is money that's owed to players who no longer play on the team. So eventually when you restructure, you're going to have some dead money. The bet is, is that you're not going to have that much dead money and that the salary cap is going to be so high that that money is kind of neg negligible. Right. But if you restructure a bunch of people, well, you're going to have a problem if you don't 
stack those restructures properly. Now, the Browns have a very advanced front office. They will probably be very responsible in how they do this. Um, but the Browns could free up anywhere between 60 to $80 million in cat space with just restructures alone. Now, they're not going to restructure to the point to where they get $80 million free in cat space unless they feel like this is the year that they can win a championship and that they feel like they can sign Chris Jones, Mike Evans, and a bunch of dudes who will be worth $80 million in cat space. Um, so don't think that the Browns are going to be walking into free agency with $80 million to spend, but that's possible, right? So now that we kind of know how all of this works, what are the Browns' Big moves going to be to free up some cap space. Are they going to have to get rid of somebody? Let's talk about Nick Chubb, right? Because this is the first guy that people bring up. And I get why people are on this side of it, right? Some people say that you might not want to resign, I mean, extend Nick Chubb or resign Nick Chubb or restructure Nick Chubb, that you might want to just let him walk after 2025. I am in the camp that thinks you should give Nick Chubb an extension. And the reason I think. Giving him an extension is a good idea is a reason why a lot of people, my colleagues, don't think giving Nick Chubb an extension is a good idea. And it's because of the uncertainty that surrounds Nick Chubb right now. Because everybody is so uncertain about Nick Chubb, Nick Chubb included, right? He just had a devastating knee injury. He's probably going to like it. Be he, We'd be lucky to get him back by week one. All of those things are true and things that would scare a lot of teams away from re-signing a running back who's approaching the wrong side of 30. But I think Nick Chubb's a special case and I would be willing to bet on Nick Chubb being a special case and I think if you bet on Nick Chubb right now odds are that you walk out of it in a couple years feeling really good about the deal that you got with Nick Chubb um, right now Nick Chubb's due for I think about 12 million in base salary 15 in salary cap hit it's not that big of a deal if he just plays out his current contract I think that 15 million dollars in salary cap is fine um but i think nick chubb and i think more importantly nick chubb's worth whatever percentage of the salary cap that that is 15 million dollars is really not that much in the grand scheme of things it's a lot for a running back but i think nick chubb has transcended just the tag of just being a running back for the cleveland browns um but i think if you get an extension it's probably not gonna be a super long term you're not gonna give him like a five-year contract extension but i would consider giving him a two year contract extension i think nick chubb will probably be good into his 30s i think he will come back from this acl injury and play well yes you are making a gamble yes you are taking a little bit of a bet you will save some money now and you might save some money in the long run if nick chubb ends up being worth it but i do think that nick chubb will end up being worth it and i think you'll feel a lot better about it in two years if you can get nick chubb what under around 15 million dollars in base salary for the next couple of years um because i don't think nick chubb's gonna be trying to reset the market um in a year where he's coming back from an acl injury the browns aren't gonna try to reset the market but if you give him fair value i think there's a chance that you can get nick chubb on a decent enough contract um because everybody's so uncertain about him and you can end up saving some cat space now i think Nick Chubb's one of the most important thing, players to this organization. I think Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski all know that. Um, and I think if that's the case, then do what not a lot of people would do, give him an extension. And not what a lot of people expect Andrew Barry to do, which is give him an extension because a lot of people assume that he has, um, you know, the, the don't spend money on a running back opinion. And he might. But I don't think Nick Chubb is a running back in his mind. I think Nick Chubb's a core piece to the Cleveland Browns. And I think it would make a lot of sense to extend at this point because you can get a discount. Um, it's a little bit of a gamble, but I'm willing to gamble on Nick Chubb. Like if there's one person on this team who has been worthy of a gamble, it's Nick Chubb. It truly is to me. Um, Amari Cooper. A lot of opinions on what you could do with this deal. You can let him go and save $23 million in salary cap. That would be really risky given that he's your best receiver. Like you would have to be confident that you can get two receivers 
in free agency. Um, I don't think that they're going to let Amari Cooper go. And I don't think they're going to take the giant swing at wide receiver that some people are expecting, right? I think, you know, a lot of us got fixated on Mike Evans or even Michael Pittman. I don't know if they go that far in free agency. I think you have to have your eyes set on, you know, some different targets. A Hunter Renfro, if he gets cut. Uh, Mike Williams, if he gets cut. Like, moves like that might be what the Browns choose to go with. Um, that being said, Amari Cooper's cap hit is going to be about $23 million. I think he's been worth his cap hit. Um, and I think it would be more beneficial to the Browns just to let him play out this contract. Um, you're not going to extend him to a number that makes sense for both you and Amari Cooper. Um, because Amari Cooper is coming off the best couple of years of his career. And he's not going to want to take a pay cut off of that. But Amari Cooper's also getting older so he's gonna want 28 29 million dollars uh to sign a extension and the browns probably want to get him down to 15 to 17 million dollars right so that discrepancy alone is not enough for an extension to be birthed out of more than likely um, what would have to happen for amari cooper to stay on the team is for the Browns to let his contract run up to 2025. Maybe you give him a transition tag, let him test the market, um, and see what's out there. He's not going to get the 27 or 28 that he wants. He's probably going to have to come back down to 19 or 18, and then the Browns can make a decision on whether they want to match that 19 or 18 or offer him a new deal. Um, and I think that's how that go out. Also, the Browns got to see where they're at in 2025, because right now Amari Cooper may makes sense for the team in 2024 you got Deshaun Watson you're going all in on Deshaun Watson but let's say we live in a world where Deshaun Watson stinks in 2024 just flat out stinks and it doesn't look good and he plays all the games and it's not rust it's not because he's not out there he just stinks like let's say he stinks you probably don't want to have Amari Cooper on the roster in 2025 right like you probably just want to just be able to move on and and eat a cap year for Deshaun Watson and be able to get off that contract as soon as possible. Um, so I think it makes sense for Amari Cooper to just sit on the deal. I think it makes sense for the Cleveland Browns to just sit on the deal. The cap hit is worth it. I don't think you want to re-sign him, and I don't think he wants to re-sign right now because he's probably going to want to see where the market's going to take him unless the Browns are willing to give him $28, 29000000 million, and then we're not even talking about saving money at that point. So all those reasons – it feels like they're just going to sit on this contract to me. Um, the Jack Conklin's been another one that's been brought up. The Browns really have some limited options with Jack Conklin. Um, they could restructure him, which would make sense for him and kind of make sense for the Browns, but they would only really save a couple million dollars if they do it that way. Um, they could trade him after June 1st and save about $4.5 million, but it's going to be difficult to do <laughs> um if we're just worried about the cap game right because they would still have to pay out some bonuses and things like that and i don't know if the raw like if that will actually end up saving them money in the long run but they could trade them post june 1st say 4.5 million dollars and that might be something that they consider doing but only i think that's I don't know if that's something they want to do because keeping him would be a benefit too. Um, whether Jack Conklin starts or not, if Jack Conklin's on the team, you know you have an elite situation if anybody is to get hurt at right tackle during the season. So in a season where you're trying to go for it all and you just saw how your tackle death got obliviated, uh, obliv ob blown away, whatever the word that I'm trying to think of right now, <laughs> Um, but you just saw your tackle death get destroyed at the end of this season. So maybe it might make sense for this team to consider just keeping the death there. Um, Jack Conklin's cap hit for this year is $12 million. It's not super crazy, but it is high for somebody who you might not anticipate starting. Um, and if he does start, then you got to make sure DeWan, you know, all, all the stuff with him's cool. So, it's going to be an interesting situation to see what they do with Jack. I think that can go a number of ways. Um, I can see them keeping him. I can see them restructuring him. I can see them trading him. I can see it all happening. They can't cut him because he still has a lot of guaranteed money left, so it would actually hurt them in cat space to cut him. Um, but 
those are their options. Jed Wills is one. Like the, he does have multiple void years on his contract, so you could restructure Jed Wills to save a little bit of money. You could also trade Jed Wills and save money. But you know, it, trading a player in their fifth year option is always a difficult thing to do because that money is going to the team that trades for him. So they have to take most of that money. Remember when Baker Mayfield got traded on his fifth-year option, it was a big hassle to figure out how much of that money Carolina was going to take and how much the Browns are going to eat. Um, and that was for a quarterback that they hoped to start and they thought they were getting a good deal on. For a left tackle who's coming off a knee injury, who the Browns aren't necessarily thrilled with, but his starting level, I don't know if there's going to be a ton of buyers out there for Jet Wills in a trade. So you could restructure, save five million. I would say they would only really go to this if they really want to sign like a big name. Like if they got like Chris Jones to say he wants to come here, then they'll start pulling out all the stops and making these restructures. Um, the restructures that are likely to happen, Deshaun Watson, we already talked about it. He's going to free up about $30 million with the restructure here. Um, and Denzel Ward is probably going to free up about $10 million with the restructure. Um, they're going to do something with Nick Chubb's contract. I think they sit on Amari Cooper's number. I don't know how much cat space they're looking to come into free agency with. They'll probably restructure to the point, like do some simple restructures and free up about $60 million of cap space um, for the team. But... I don't think that they go super overboard with it. I don't think that they're going to go multiple big fish swinging like $80 million would suggest that they want to do. So that's my thoughts on how the Browns can free up some cat space. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Y'all have a great day. Have an even better night. Peace.